الحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعص ما فلا يضر الا نفسه اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم شهد الله انه لا اله الا هو الملائكه واولو العلم قائما بالقسط لا اله الا هو العزيز الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين اللهم امين يا رب today uh, i want to talk about umar bin abdul aziz now you all may have heard of umar bin abdul aziz i'm sure many of you have heard of him if you've not heard of him i'll give a very small introduction because i don't want to talk about his personal life and his personal piety and his personal fear of allah and his personal humbleness but i want to just give a quick uh, synopsis of his uh, so you have an idea what i'm talking about uh, Umar bin Abdul Aziz was a, uh, a, a prince. He was part of the royal family. And uh, um, he was somebody, if he wore clothes one time, he would not wear it again. He was very rich. He was part of the aristocrat. But uh, what happened was the, the king that was the king of that time, uh, his name was Suleiman. And uh, he had very little king. He had very little kids. He tried very hard that he can give the throne to his kids. You know, he would make them wear clothes to see if they can look big and try to get them to wear, carry swords, but they couldn't even carry the sword. So he has these, and he became ill, and his ill was, uh, it was not reversible, and he knew that, and he knew he was going to uh, pass away. So he uh, decided, okay, since I'm going to die, and my kids are so young, so let me be just, let me be just in one thing, and that is who I will choose as my next successor. And so I'm par shorting, shortening the history very much, uh, so over here. So uh, he was given the advice by Raja, was his name. He was the architect of the, you know the Dome of the Rock, the architecture on that, he's actually one of the architects, the original architects of Masjid al-Aqsa itself. So he gave him the advice that choose Umar bin Abdul Aziz. One thing about Umar bin Abdul Aziz that I will tell you very quickly, once Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anh, and it was his sunnah that he would, you know, take routes at night to see what the situation in the city is, you all know this. And one day he heard, one day he heard that uh, there is a mother and a daughter talking. This is a very famous story, you all have heard of this, but I want to make this point one point that you may not have heard. So he, Umar, Umar bin Khattab is making his rounds and he hears uh, the mother saying to the daughter, have you uh, brought the milk? She says, yes, I brought the milk. She says, okay, put the water in the milk. And she said, well, Umar bin Khattab, the Khalifa has said, you can't mix the water with the milk. And she said, the mother said, well, Umar is not here. He's probably sleeping in his house. And she responded, well, Umar is not here, but Allah is watching what we're doing. And to mix the water with the milk is cheating the people. Umar heard this when he was making his tours. When he heard this, he said, he, he wanted to find out which family this is. He found out the family Ban, Banu Halal, and he then wanted his son to marry this daughter, because he felt he's, she's very pious. She had a chance to steal and make more money with her mother, but she didn't. She, she did the right thing. So Umar said, I had a dream that my son, and you know, from my lineage, from my lineage, there will be a man who will have a mark on his face, and he will bring justice on earth, just as there was injustice. To forward now, you know, uh, the type of injustices that were done to the family of the Prophet with Hussein radiallahu anh, what Hijaj bin Yusuf had done, what had happened in Harra, those of you who know that when, in what happened in Medina in the, in the days of Harra, you can say. So a lot of injustices were being uh, coming. Now a situation was, there is this man, he was an cat. he wasn't particularly pious. Uh, and now this king, 
Now his name is Suleiman, he's going to die. And he thought, well, this man is, you know, he's, 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 he doesn't have the normal vices, meaning he's not playing with girls, he's not lusting after money for more than, you know, what his, what his affordability, he's not doing injustices to people. So he nominates him, but there was a fear of nominating Omar bin Abdul Aziz, and that was that the people wouldn't like his name. Hijaz bin Yusuf was particularly against Omar bin Abdul Aziz. Umar bin Abdul Aziz was the governor of Medina. And at this time, you know, the students of Abu Huraira, the students of Ibn Umar, they were still there. Okay? In fact, you can say Umar bin Abdul Aziz was the founder of the Maliki Fiqh in many ways, which I'm not, that's not my subject right now. But Umar bin Abdul Aziz, he wrote down the name of Umar bin Abdul Aziz. He said, Umar bin Abdul Aziz will be my successor, and after Umar bin Abdul Aziz, it will be Yazid ibn Marwan. Okay? So he wrote this, and he put this in a letter. And then he called all the governors and all the, the royal family and had them give bayah to the letter. They don't know what's inside the letter. They only know the name of the next Khalifa is in this letter. Then, you know, he actually passed away. But Raja, who was his secretary, was afraid people are going to rebel and stand up and not accept Omar bin Abdul Aziz. So, as he passed away, he told the people the second time, I won't give the whole story right now, he gave the, got them to give bayah second time. Then he brought them to the masjid and had them give bayah third time. This is now when he, the announcement is there, he's passed away. Now they open up the letter and what Raja did was, everyone that he knew would have a problem that I should be the next successor or my brother should be the next successor, he put one person with a sword by his head. Okay. Now they were going to open. Now this has never been done in the kingships before. Always, you know, it's announced publicly this person will be the next uh, king, not Khalifa. They weren't Khalifa, they were kings. So now Omar bin Abdul Aziz, his name is read, and one of them actually begins to stand up, and as soon as he, he just takes out the sword a little bit, and he then sits down. Right. So, um, anyway, Omar bin Abdul Aziz is the Khalifa now. Now, very, very important. A few things that I want to mention. The first command, the first command that Umar bin Abdul Aziz did was on the grave site of Sulaiman, the king. Now, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, when they chose him as the Khalifa, you're the next leader of the Muslims, the first thing he did is he revoked his bar. He said, I don't want it. He said, you all are here, the family is here, you just choose somebody amongst you. And then this Raja convinced him, no, 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 you're going to create problems like this. Now at this point, to discuss who's going to be the next Khalifa with everyone there. Then they create more problems. You have to accept this. And then he invited the ulama, the scholars of the, the great, great scholars. Musayyib was one of them. Musayyib bin, uh, uh, Sayyid bin Musayyib and others that were students of the Sahaba, they, he brought them. They also said, no, no, we're happy with you being the Amir of the Muslims. We're happy with you being the leader of the Muslims. Before this was kingship, so it was forced, right? This was the first time after a hundred years almost that the Muslims themselves choose a ruler for themselves. And this was an extremely pious, he changed overnight from being like an aristocrat. He would, you know, he would spend, just one personal example is, you know, he sent his servant one day to buy clothes for him. And when the cloth, cloth came, he felt this, the, that it's not soft. He, sent, he spent 800 dinars, and he said, oh, this is not soft. And he told his secretary, Go, give it back. When he was the Khalifa, he had assigned himself a salary of two dirhams a day. Now he bought a piece of cloth for eight dirhams. That was 800, this is eight dirhams. And he felt it and he said, this is too soft, it's too luxurious. Go send this back and get me something cheaper that the common people would take. Now, Omar bin Abdul Aziz, was a very interesting person and his government, the type of government he set based upon Islamic principles was extremely interesting. One of the, for, the first hukum, that he, that just to give you an idea of the type of person he did was, one of the first things he did was, on the graveyard of Suleiman, what he did was, he commanded that, what had happened is, there was an, uh, you know, in the, bound, in the borders of the Islamic lands, there was skirmishes between the, uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic Empire. And in one case, 
the Byzantine Empire had been circled and was choking the Islamic army. And when the Suleiman had heard about this, instead of trying to help them, what he did was he said, let them die. Let them die and don't let them come back. Let them die, don't let them come back. Omar bin Abdul Aziz, when he became the Khalifa on his gravesite, he said, no, let them come back. Let them come back and, 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 and I'll read, if I have a chance, if I have time, I'm going to read to you his letter to, uh, his letter to, um, his letter to uh, Mansur bin Ghalib, who was his commander in chief of the army, what, what the things he said. But really what I want to talk about is some of his policies that he put in place in the government. The first, one of the first things he did was he removed all the governors that were known to be tyrannical. Because when the, when the leaders before were tyrannical, then those that were under were also tyrannical. And if they, the leader on top can get in, in, away with injustices, then the people in the bottom also think they can get away with injustices. So one of the things that he did was he had a route. And remember, he is the Khalifa of three Islamic continents. He is the... He is, he has Africa under him, he has the Middle East under him, he has Asia, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia under him, he has a part of Europe under him, all of this land is under him. And what he did was, he put, you know how there's a post office? So he had a person running letters. And anyone can stop this man that's running the letters, you know, it, the horse would go to a certain distance and then the next person would carry on, and the next person would carry on, and the next person would carry on. So he had this system in which any man, lady, child could stop the person and give them him the letter, okay, and say, give this letter to the Khalifa, right, directly, right? And so, for example, I'll give you one example. One lady gave, stopped the, 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 the post guy and said, here's a letter for the Khalifa. She was an African lady. She was complaining that I'm an old lady, and I have my hens and my, you know, crops, and my walls are small. The walls of my house are small, and thieves come in, and they always take my things away. So Omar bin, uh, Omar bin Abdul Aziz wrote a letter back to the imam of that city, to the imam of the Jami Masjid of that city. He was also in the army. He was like a captain in the army, a lieutenant, you could say. And he told him, there is a lady, find her in that area of yours, her walls are small, bring them high and make sure there's no one stealing from her, uh, from her area. People would come to him, he, he would have an open door policy. Open door policy, anyone can come in, especially if it was, you know what he said, he had a rule in the government. Anyone that tells me about any injustice, anyone who tells me about any injustice, I'll give him 300 dirhams. I'll give him 300 dirhams and this would be announced in the Hajj when Umar would be there. I mean, Omar bin Abdul Aziz is there, all the Muslims are there for Hajj, right? All the people are coming from Hajj from all parts of the Muslim lands. And he would say, anyone who tells me about an injustice, I'll give him, in some of, you know, history books differ, right? So, in like, Tariq uh, al I think it says 300, and some of the other places it said 100 dirhams. So between 100 and 300 dirhams, he would announce, if you would tell me of any injustice being done by any of the governors, any injustice being done by anybody, I'll give you 300 dirhams. He had the same policy for if you bring any in, a creative idea. If you have any in, like great idea that you bring to me and I like it, I, and I enforce it in the, in, the, in the lands of the Muslims, then I will also give you 300 dirhams. As a, as a, this is one of the policies he had. Another policy he had is what today in, 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 in political science in, in the Muslim world, I mean in the, in, in the Western world, is known as libertarian government. Anybody know what a libertarian government is? Libertarian government is a government in which the government is, tries its best not to be involved in the affairs of the people at all, right? So you try to keep the government as much as small and lean and mean as possible, and you don't interfere on the rights or the, uh, on the citizens at all. So for example, before Omar bin Abdul Aziz, the government used to plant seeds on the River Nile. Right? The, the government used to plant seeds on the river, and you know the River Nile is big, and this would be like all government property. He said no. This is Nile. This is where people can grow agriculture for themselves. 
Why should the government take this? Right? Why should the government take all this land and deprive the people from growing their own crops and their own everything? So he stopped that and let the people grow their own agriculture across the now, can you imagine the type of employment that would bring, like across the Nile, especially at that time, we didn't have an industrial society yet. We all societies were agrarian societies. They were all agriculture societies at that time. So Omar uh, bin Abdul Aziz, he was very, very careful. Like even in his piety, I'll just give you one example, right? Uh, it's very, uh, a lot of uh, narrations on this, but uh, like for example, when Omar bin Abdul Aziz, uh, Aziz was asked, just as an example, the governors wrote him a letter asking, we need more revenue, we need more, because he believed in a limited government, and the others were used to from previously having a what? A bigger, more luxurious government, more expenditures. So somebody, some of the governors wrote to him, we need more money for candles at night. We need more money for candles at night. The person who wrote this was a governor of Medina, I think his name was Abu Bakr. His name was Abu Bakr. And he was a friend of Umar bin Abdul Aziz in the previous days. So Umar bin Abdul Aziz wrote to him, what happened to Abu Bakr? Now that you're rich, you ask for all these expenditures. I remember when you were young and we used to go at night without these candles. Why can't you do this now? If you want candles, expenditure, all these luxurious expenditures for yourself, then do it from your own personal money. Don't take the money of the, of the government. Right? Omar bin Abdul Aziz, his wife, like one day, one day, you know, he's the Khalifa, right? Of three different continents, right? A lady comes in, she wants to complain to Omar bin Abdul Aziz. A lady comes in and she wants to complain to Omar bin Abdul Aziz about her situation. She comes into the house and you know his wife, her name was Fatima. She was a princess from seven different, uh, like her father was a king. Her, uh, you know, like this. She was a princess from seven different directions. Her, her husband was a Khalifa. She was, you know, what Umar bin Abdul. By the way, I'll tell you this personal story about Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Umar bin Abdul Aziz told his wife the day he became the Khalifa. He told his wife, "Take all the jewelry." She said, "All? Why all the jewelry? My dad has given me jewelry. My brothers have given me jewelry. Different people have given me gifts." He said, "If you want to stay in marriage with me." Because we have, what he said, what we were doing previously was wrong to the people. We were taking the money of the people away from them. Take all of your money and put it in a suitcase. Okay? And I will put this suitcase, I will put this suitcase at the, at, against the wall. Meaning the last place in Baytul Mal. In the last place, meaning everything, if everything goes into the expenditure for the Muslims, and the only thing that's left is the suitcase, only then I'll open it. Otherwise, when I die, the next Khalifa will give it back to you. So she took all her jewelry and put it in that box. That's just an example of the type of person he had become. So this lady comes to his house to complain about her situation. She had five daughters. She had five daughters. And she was a single mother. Okay? She was a single mother. She had no one to help her. So she comes into the house of, of the... the the king, the khalifa, not a king. He was not a king, he was a khalifa. He was chosen by the people. She comes into his house and she sees, there's no decorations here. What is this man gonna help me? Right? And she sees there is a man outside who keeps looking inside, meaning Fatima, she had no hijab on. She wasn't covering uh, like you should for the public. A Muslim woman should cover the... So she kept seeing there's a man out there by the well he keeps looking at Fatima, the, 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 you know, the, the, the wife of the leader of the Muslims. She says, there's a man out there, he keeps looking at you. She says, that's not just, that's my husband, Omar bin Abdul Aziz, that keeps looking at me. So when he got done, he came inside the house. And he said, he said what is your need? So she told, him, her, she told him, I have five daughters, I have this situation, this situation. Omar bin Abdul Aziz, Omar bin Abdul Aziz said, okay, give me the names of the people in your family. She wrote down her name, the first daughter's name. She's going to get this. I forget the amounts that he sent for her. But he set, set a spot, stipend for each daughter. First, first daughter he wrote, he said, she said, Alhamdulillah. Second daughter she wrote, she, she said, Alhamdulillah. He, she, he said, who's the third daughter? He wrote the name of the third daughter. She said, Alhamdulillah. Fourth daughter, fifth daughter, she started praising him. Instead of praising God, she started praising him. So he stopped. 
He said, you're going to have to ask your first four daughters to cover the expenses of the fifth daughter because up till the fourth daughter, you were praising Allah. Now it's getting to my ego. You're praising me, it's getting to my ego. So now you have, now that's it. You know what happened is, this was one of the last things that Umar bin Abdul Aziz did. She had taken the letter back to, uh, back to Kufa. When the governor of Iraq read this letter, he started to cry because Umar had already died by that time. Right? And Umar, and she was like, why are you crying? He said, you haven't reached, the news hasn't reached you, but Umar has already passed away. Okay? One of the other things that Umar bin Abdul Aziz did, which is very, very interesting, is that, you know, he abolished all the taxes except for zakat. And, and he had this rule that if somebody is blind, a blind person gets a full-time service person. A full-time service person to help a blind person. So in the entire kingdom, wherever there were blind people, they, each blind person was given a, a helper to be with that person. And any other type of handicapped person, would uh, one, one, uh, one, one helper would help two handicapped people throughout the day. So let's say there's a handicapped on this street and there's another handicapped person on this street. So one person would be helping both of them and they would get a stipend. Another thing Omar bin Abdul Aziz did is you know what happens is sometimes when you're in the city, the teachers are paid well. And you go into the ghettos or you go into the rural areas, the teachers are not paid so well. Omar bin Abdul Aziz equal made the payment of every teacher the same. He made the, the payment of every teacher exactly the same. So whether so good teachers were going into the city and good teachers were also going into the rural and urban areas to teach the people. They didn't, have, they didn't make that difference. Not only that, Omar ibn Abdul Aziz said, every teacher will get a house, every teacher will get a horse, even though he himself had only a mule. He kept a mule. Actually, I'll tell you this about this too in a second. Uh, one thing that I want to say. Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, he said, you'll get a, you'll get a house, you get a horse, and you get a servant to help you in your tasks for every single teacher throughout the Islamic kingdom. Okay? The other thing that was very interesting is, the day he became the Khalifa, they were going to have a big party for him. Right? So he went and he saw, oh, they have these carpets, you know, the red carpet, and they have this, and he, he said, gather all this, in, gather all this, sell it in the market, and whatever money you have, Put it in the tre in the Baytul Mal. Put it in the treasury. This does not belong to us. It belongs to the people. the people. Belongs to the people. And you know, it's historically recorded. I have the names of the narrators who narrate this. There was one person in charge of collecting zakat in North Africa. I forget his name right now, because, but he was in charge of getting zakat in what? North Africa, and he he narrates that I would collect the zakat. I would collect the zakat, and I would find no one to spend it on. I would collect the poor mo the money for the poor, and I would find no poor person in the entire Af African region. And, and this was because of the policies that he had. The policies he had is, government expenditure should be minimum, taxes should be minimum. He, he said to the non-Muslims, he said, other than the jizya tax, if you pay the jizya tax, you have equal rights to the Muslims. Equal rights to the Muslims once you pay your jizya, <coughs> because jizya was a tax that was used on the minorities. It was a tax used on mi minorities to protect the minorities. Tax used, jizya was a tax, and the people that gave jizya were called dhimmi. Dhimmi means, like you know, even the Urdu word, zimma, zimma lina, like zimma, zimma dari. Zimma means to take the responsibility of. So, the money would go to protect the, uh, the, 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 the Zimis, the, the non-Muslims, right? And he would, he would tell them, if you pay jizya, you're only going to pay jizya and no other taxes. And uh, let's see how much time. Oh, I don't have that much time. So let me finish my second khutbah. أقول قولي هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم ولي سائر المسلمين والمسلمات. جزاك الله خير. الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له 
ونشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله أصله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعة من يتع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصهما فلا يضر إلا نفسه So let me just uh, mention a few more things and then we have to pray. I'm going to really mention two more things and then we have to uh, pray inshallah. I mean get ready for prayer. We have a small fundraiser we need to do today and that's why I need to finish earlier inshallah. So uh, one of the other things that I want to talk about is, because I want to make this a little bit faster, is that from the money of the zakat, anyone that had, and by the way in Islam you should know this, living in debt or slavery is the same thing. The word in Quran, wafir riqab. Wafir riqab means to, for your necks to be tied up, which means you're a slave. If you have a debt, then you know if you have a debt in the bank, you're basically working for the bank, right? You're not working for yourself. If you have a debt in the bank, then you're working for the bank. And if you are a slave, then you're working for your master. So they both have these similarities. Omar bin Abdul Aziz announced anyone who has taken any debt because he was, his situation was so bad, he had no choice but to pay debt. The, 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 mat, the money was used from zakat to pay the people's debt. People, and, and then they didn't know what to do with the zakat money. The fund in the treasury was so much, they didn't know what to do with it. Then they announced after that, whoever wants to get married, we will pay for his marriage. And because obviously in a healthy society, marriage in Islam is a sacred institute, is one of the foundations and the aims and the goals of Islamic law, is for people to get married and to have healthy marriages. And so the government also took on the responsibility that we will pay for the marriages of the people. He had a rule in place that not to put such and such weight over animals. For example, if there's a horse, he had to standardize the weights. You cannot put more than this much weight on the horses. And you cannot put this much weight over the camels. Right? I think it was something from 50 kilograms to 150 kilograms, depending upon the type of animal that it was. I don't remember right now the exact numbers, okay? But Omar bin Abdul Aziz was one of those people that standardized is the weights throughout the Islamic Kingdom. Okay. Now again, time is running out. I have to end right now. So tonight, tonight, I'm actually going to give a more detailed analysis of his life from his childhood, from the dream of Omar that I was talking about, that he had that mark. I'll talk about all his life, his, who were his teachers, how he really became a Khalifa, and all of the things that he did during the Khilafah, because there's so much that I didn't mention. I just mentioned the things that people usually mention, but the actual historical details, the actual letters that were written, I'll be going over those two, inshallah. So, inshallah, let's end with, so the, what is the point of today's khutbah? I want to end with this verse of the Quran. Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illahu. Allah bears witness, there is no divine other than he. Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikatu and the angels also bear witness that there is only one divine, one God. Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikatu wa ulul ilm and the people of knowledge also bear witness there is no divine, there is no God other than Allah. Shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illahu wal malaikatu wa ulul ilm qa'iman bil qist and the most important attribute of Allah is meaning that there is an Allah, there is a God, and Allah is on justice. And Allah loves justice. Allah loves justice. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz didn't do a lot of fasts. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz didn't do a lot of nawafil prayers. He didn't do a lot of ibadah as such. But his justice was so much that there was barakah, there was blessings everywhere in the Islamic lands, in the Muslim lands. And that like there was no, there were, it was hard to find a poor person anymore. And this is what the government was doing. And you know, I want to end with one statement. One of the, uh, one of the, one of this, one of the uh, people of the time wrote that when Walid was our king, Walid was the king, two kings before Umar bin Abdul, when Walid was the king, we used to talk about wealth. And when Suleiman became the king, we used to talk about women. Because this is what they were into. So this is what they talked about. When Umar bin Abdul Aziz became the Khalifa of the Muslims, we used to talk about how many prayers we did. We used to talk about how much remembrance of God we did. We used to talk about how much we gave in the cause of charity and to help people. Because when your leader is like that, then the people are like that. Allahumma taj'al khilafatul muslimin 
اللهم رد رد المسلمين على دينهم ردا جميلا اللهم اللهم انصر من نصر دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وانا اتنا في الدنيا حسنه وفي الاخره حسنه وقنا عذاب النار ربنا ظلمنا انفسنا وان لم تغفر لنا وترحمنا لنكونن من الخاسرين اللهم اللهم ارحمنا بالقران العظيم واجعله لنا اماما ونورا وهدى ورحمه وارزقنا تلاوته اناء الليل واطراف النهار امين يا رب don't stand up for prayers yet we have a small fundraising to do we'll pray after the fundraising ان الله يعملكم بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah.